pleasure and honor to be part of the Science for Alaska seminar series. My talk today is entitled Quaking, Shaking, and Supercomputing in Alaska. I'd like to first acknowledge my affiliations, University of Alaska Fairbanks, Geophysical Institute, the College of Natural Sciences and Mathematics, and then also the Arctic Region Supercomputing Center, uh, whose computing facility plays a major role in the research I'll be showing. My talk outline will start with an overview of earthquakes in Alaska. I'll discuss supercomputing and seismology in general, and then we'll look at some focus areas in Alaska. And the overarching theme of this talk, or what I'd like you to take away, is the generic question, what is an earthquake? Try to get an intuitive sense or feeling about how big are they, how long do they last, where do they occur? It's not a very obvious thing. My research objectives are to accurately model ground motion from earthquakes in Alaska and also to obtain accurate subsurface images of the crustal structure in Alaska. I won't be discussing those as much in this talk, but those are my research interests and extend directly from the things I'll be showing. I'll start with this slide. What is this building and why is it important? You may not recognize it. This building, I'll give you a hint, is within 100 meters of where we're sitting. Another hint is that this was figure one of a paper in the Bulletin of the Seismological Society of America, written in 1936. So why is this being featured in a seismology journal? And the reason is, is that this, in 1935, was the UAF Eielson building before we added the second story to it home of North America's farthest north seismometer in 1935, this mass and pendulum device. And so it shows that seismological research has really been conducted in Alaska and in the University of Alaska Fairbanks for a long, long time. And we continue this tradition from, from this time to today. I have to give an overview on plate tectonics because plate tectonics is what drives earthquakes and really the, the context for all the, the tsunamis and earthquakes that we see globally. So what I've shown here is a map of magnitude 5 earthquakes over the last 30 years on the earth where you don't see any coastlines, continents, oceans, you just see dots, you just see earthquakes. And these earthquakes show the boundaries of plates. At the boundaries of plates there are earthquakes which manifest the deformation that's occurring as plates move past each other. I'll show some more information, but this would be North America. You are right here in Alaska. This big one is the Pacific Plate, known as the Ring of Fire going around the Pacific. If we add the continents to give us a better context, we see uh, where these plates are. Alaska is part of the North American Plate. We have the San Andreas Fault boundary here. And then along the Aleutian arc here, we have a different kind of plate boundary. So we know where the plate boundaries are based on where earthquakes are happening. And we also know how these plates are moving relative to one another. And this motion, which is captured by a bunch of arrows, so each plate is moving relative to another. In this case, we have to fix something. So in this case, the North American plate is stationary. And all these arrows show how every other part of the Earth is moving with respect to North America. So along the San Andreas Fault, you have this motion where one plate is sliding past the other. And under the Aleutian Arc in Alaska, you see what is known as convergence. The Pacific Plate is actually going underneath Alaska, and that's causing the great, the largest earthquakes that we have. So this is the snapshot of plate tectonics and to keep in mind sort of where all these earthquakes come from and why there are so many in particular in Alaska. So now we have some context looking at Alaska of what these particular arrows are. These arrows are like the previous slide showing that the Pacific Plate is going underneath Alaska at a rate here of 2.5 inches per year. And this map shows the largest earthquakes that have been recorded over the last century. Now some of these earthquakes show up as dots like in the original map, but others are very large. For example, the 1964 earthquake outlined here was the second largest earthquake ever recorded, a magnitude 9.2 earthquake. And along the entire Aleutian Arc, you can see 1938, 1946, 
These earthquakes have ruptured some portion of the plate boundary over the last century. Even along here, Queen Charlotte Fault, 1972, 1949. So Alaska is one of the most seismically active regions in the world. It's by far the most seismically active region in North America. And even though most of these earthquakes are associated with the boundary between the Pacific and North America plate, there are earthquakes throughout all of Alaska. And even within Fairbanks, there have been three magnitude seven earthquakes in the past hundred years. So pretty much every part of Alaska is prone to sizable earthquakes. If we look at another representation of this, here, here I've, I've plotted a map of the dots are earthquakes, the colors according to depth, and we're looking at this is Canada, Alaska, Pacific Plate, so we're looking at a, a piece of southern Alaska. And what you see is the colors show a very systematic trend. There are red dots further out here, and as you go in, yellow, green, and blue. What it's showing is that these earthquakes are getting deeper and deeper. So what exactly are we looking at? Well, just for context, this is Fairbanks, this is Anchorage. If we look at this profile here and plot it at the top, we see what is called a subduction zone. That is, underneath Alaska, there is the Pacific plate is going down underneath Alaska, and within that plate there are earthquakes, and these earthquakes extend even as far as about right underneath Fairbanks. We have earthquakes at 200, 160 kilometers depth um, it, within the Pacific plate as it goes down. You see the red dots all over the map, and so pretty much every part of Alaska is it's a very broad zone of deformation that can experience earthquakes. I'll now show a famous movie from the 1964 earthquake where someone happened to have a film carrying, uh, carrying a film at the time of the earthquake. And so here are some pieces of footage. In Anchorage, Alaska's largest city, Buildings collapse, streets and homes slip into the earth. Fires break out all over the stricken area. Oil tanks explode, sending flames shooting into the sky. The clock stopped at 5.36, and 15 minutes later, there was silence. So that's really, that's really remarkable footage that's actually credited to the U.S. Army. They put the, the uh, dramatic music soundtrack as well in there. But it's really remarkable to have some footage of actual shaking. It's, there's not much footage like that, even in the era of YouTube and people carrying around cameras to get actual ground shaking on video is a powerful way to, to show what this is like. Now in addition to that, after the shaking, there's phenomenal destruction. And this shows some of the images from Anchorage in the 1964 earthquake. In particular, this is the Government Hill Elementary School, really dramatic uh, uh, effects of both shaking and deformation. There was liquefaction of soil. So the damage is highly variable on account of different soil types and structures. So this is the Turnigan Heights subdivision, with which these are, here's one scale, you can see these are individual homes in the subdivision. If we zoom in, you can see what one of these homes looked like, total destruction, and perhaps the most dramatic view of the Turnigan Heights deformation. Now we're looking a little scale back. This is the ocean, this is what appears to be undeformed, and these are homes, individual homes in here where the whole area just basically um, liquefied and sort of slid down toward the ocean. So really phenomenal scale of what kind of destruction happened during this magnitude 9.2 earthquake. But it's not all about southern Alaska where the really biggest ones are. Yes, we can have big magnitude 7 earthquakes in interior Alaska. And this is an image from a paper published in 1948 of an earthquake in central Alaska in 1947, and the quote in the, uh, in the article says, in Fairbanks, many objects were thrown from shelves. This resulted in heavy damage in liquor and grocery stores. Many of the merchants, being aware of the earthquake hazard, have wires permanently stretched across the front of their shelves to prevent the fall of bottled goods. These reduce the loss. 
Now, I don't know about you, but when I go around Fairbanks, I don't see any wires stretched across the front of shelves. And this is really a reminder that, why, why is this the case in 1948? Well, the reason is, is because in 1937, a mere 10 years before this, there was a huge earthquake, well, magnitude 7 plus, uh, that occurred in Salcha and caused a lot of damage. And 10 years isn't very long to, to, to be forgotten. So we come at a time where we haven't had a big earthquake in a while, but this, this quote really uh, was impressive to me in thinking that it's, it's really a matter of how long it's been since the last earthquake in terms of how much people care. So if we look, there was the 1937 and 47 earthquakes. Those are so, sort of the biggest ones that had happened. In 1996, uh, studies by Doug Christensen and a student looked at some of these historic events, and here we're looking at Fairbanks. And even at this time that the paper was written, right at that time, a magnitude 6 occurred in Minto Flats. And this is probably the strongest shaking that's been felt in Fairbanks in the last 30 years, and many people in this audience, I'm sure, felt this earthquake maybe 10 or 15 seconds of shaking in Fairbanks. It's a magnitude six, but it's a reminder that these earthquakes happen in the interior with some regularity. In 2002, there was the magnitude 7.9 Denali earthquake, which was preceded by 6.7. This is the largest continental strike slip fault ever recorded. It's a fairly famous earthquake because um, uh, because such a large earthquake had not been recorded, it served as an analog for what could happen on the San Andreas Fault in California. So one of the messages is, is that plate tectonics will not stop. We've had magnitude 7 earthquakes in the past, and we'll have them in the future. But let's look at this Denali earthquake. So if we look at a topographic map of southern Alaska, it's a very striking view of, you know, without any cities or roads or information, we can see some Remarkable features, the black here is the ocean. We see volcanoes like this one in the Wrangell St. Elias. Here's volcanoes along the Aleutian Arc. But one of the most remarkable features on this, which hopefully you identify, is this liniment that strikes right through Alaska, through the Alaska Range, and stops at the border because Canada here is flat. But here we see that this is really one of the great global faults of the world, and this is what ruptured in 2002, a magnitude 7.9 fall. This fall kind of had the stereotypical things that we think of with big earthquakes. It's a, it's a big fault where, you know, if you zoom into another scale here, this is a photo taken from an airplane looking east. This is the Parks Highway, Nenana River. We can see that from here, yeah, that looks kind of like a valley, but you wouldn't necessarily identify that this is a fault. It's a very large feature. But this shows the rupture of the earthquake, which started, it was a magnitude 6.7 a couple weeks before, and this started about here and ruptured several hundred kilometers to the east. But this is giving you a sense of scale of these very large faults. After the earthquake, there were things, huge cracks opening up in the ground. Some of these were nine feet deep in certain areas. So this is caused by the earthquake rupture itself. Off the Richardson Highway, you could see these trees just basically exploded as the rupture went by. Um, here's, here's an example, here's another example. So small things you can identify associated with the earthquakes. Larger things, the actual Richardson Highway was offset by 2.5 meters here. The maximum offset along the fault was 8.8 .8 meters. So some 20 plus, more than 20 feet of offset happened across this fault, meaning a huge chunk of land to the south moved relative to the north by this much. So it's a pretty dramatic uh, image of what, what a size of an earthquake can look like in terms of just the, the, the uh, displacement that can happen at the surface. In this case, the, pipe, the pipeline actually crossed the fault. Here in the main photo, you can see an arrow showing about where the, where the fault crosses. Now, this is kind of one of the big success stories of the pipeline was that in the 70s, geologists, engineers were aware that a large fault was crossing here. They didn't really know how active it was or how big earthquakes might be expected, but they designed it to withstand displacement associated with a magnitude 8 earthquake. And here, this, this is not, the bend is not caused by the fault. They actually 
built it this way on these rafters that allowed the pipe to slide back and forth when the shaking happened. And now the actual small kink that happened, and they did shut down the pipeline, is there's a small kink up in here, and you can also see in the top photo this kind of buckling of the pipe. So that, you know, if you have a straight segment of pipe, you have some sense that if you compress it, it's going to buckle. And so that shows the kind of damage that occurred, but it really was a remarkable anticipation that, that, that they did not cause, that this was able to withstand the shaking of a magnitude 7.9 going right underneath the fault. The most dramatic view, though, in my mind, was the images from Black Rapids Glacier, where the fault cuts through the Alaska Range and triggered massive landslides. Whole chunks of mountains slid across. This is about a mile wide. And these landslides, it should be a, a dirty white glacier here, and instead it's just blanketed by debris that was triggered by the shaking of the earthquake. So phenomenal perspective of scale of just one small section of the fault caused by these landslides. And another view, this view is looking, uh, this view is looking east on the fault. You can kind of see where these, these are moraines that have been, you know, just the landslide just blankets anything in its path. So really impressive example. This is a map from the US Geological Survey website called Did You Feel It? Where if you feel an earthquake, you can go in and answer a survey that will basically gauge how strong the shaking was that you experienced. This map is shown for Alaska, where we are a fairly sparsely populated area, but nonetheless, there are people. There were 3,186 responses that showed that the shaking in Alaska, which is predominantly yellow, corresponds to strong shaking, or in this particular area, which is kind of where the Richardson Highway crossed over, is very strong or severe. We would expect at least some areas, and there's very few people out in that region where this would be the case. So here this shows a map that the shaking is variable. So you can see that in some regions, in Anchorage, it's blue. Uh, but in general, you don't have concentric circles. The shaking depends partly on what kinds of ground you're on. Are you on bedrock? Are you on a sedimentary basin? And we'll be returning to this topic later in the talk. But just to motivate uh, sort of in scientific involvement in the public, you can do this in Fairbanks. This is an example of a magnitude 3.8, nine kilometers below Esther, where 270 people responded to say what kind of shaking, probably some of you in the audience, I'm sure. And so this doesn't look like that useful information, but the idea is a very good one. That is that when people feel shaking, we want to quantify what that shaking was and potentially um, this can provide very useful information for emergency responders. This was an earthquake just last month, magnitude 5.6 in Anchorage, where you can see the colors are a little more toward the yellow, and they had 1,300 responses. So it's a very nice way to get involved. You feel an earthquake, go to this website and uh, provide your input. This is what could happen. This is really where the tool came about. This is Northridge, California, 1994 caused $20 billion of damage, one of the largest financial catastrophes uh, the country's experienced. And what this shows is that the earthquake occurred in Northridge, and you can see that the shaking in red was violent to extreme in this particular region. And then generally things get lessened as you go away from there. But there's where this arrow is, there's this very strong shaking in Santa Monica. And this turned out the Santa Monica Pier and other areas were completely devastated by this earthquake. And scientists believe there was a strong focusing effect due to the mountains in between. So shaking was much stronger here, even though it was farther away from the earthquake. So in theory, with, with a lot of feedback and responses, this can provide valuable information. And this is why the USGS promotes this kind of thing. But for our purposes, we're interested to say that shaking can be highly variable depending on where you are. It's not just about whether you're close or far from the earthquake. I think I have one slide to remind ourselves this is ultimately, we're dealing with a math problem. This is physics being solved on a computer. So I need to show we are dealing with the equation of motion, which is the wave equation. The boxes I've highlighted here refer to the red refers to the Earth structure, which is characterized by how the density varies in the Earth and how the C is the elastic structure. S refers to, in green, the seismic wave field. 
So it's a function of how things move as a function of space, x, and time. So you can think of this in two ways. If you're standing at one particular location, then what the wave field that's being recorded is like a seismogram. How did that one point move with time? It's a little wiggly on a seismogram. Or you could think of taking a picture of the wave field, which we really can't do, but we can make in these movies. And that would be fixing the time we're looking at a snapshot of the wave field. So the wave field can be best thought of in either one of those ways. So we have the equation of motion, which relates, which basically is going to be implemented on this computer. This is the divergence of the stress. This is Hooke's law, which is in physics, you pull a spring, the, you pull a spring and the force is proportional to the, the distance that the spring is pulled. We have a boundary conditions, and we have some description of an earthquake source. Those are the elements that go into this model. Now, it doesn't look like very many equations here, but the complexity comes in because the Earth is extremely complex. All the variation that we want to describe in the Earth, whether it's at the scale of one meter or 100 meters, all the variations that might impact how a wave propagates, we need to account for. Just like when you throw a rock into a pond, that's a fairly complicated thing. It bounces off different uh, plants and rocks. You can see the wave effect is interfering with these, itself. Well, now imagine that that's occurring in a solid that's very complicated and all kinds of reverberations and wave effects are happening. So we need a computer, a big computer. And that's where the supercomputing comes in. Here's an actual example of taking the Earth and chopping it up into many, many slices, thousands of slices, where each one of these little squares represents a individual computer on a massive computer on a massive computer. So here's a supercomputer. This is actually an Arctic region supercomputing up on upper campus at UAF. And each one of these racks or blades has a set of it's like your personal computer is, is on one of these, or there's 16 of them on each one of these. By taking a very large problem, we can assign each little piece to one of these computers. And as we try to solve the wave equation, at each step in time that we move forward, we share information at the boundary of each of, these, each of these small regions. We share information at the boundary, and then we advance forward one at a time. And by doing so, we're able to take a very, very large problem that would require a huge amount of memory to actually solve, and we can do it by distributing that memory over a very large machine. And so just to say, what is a high-performance computing facility? There's three required components. One is the hardware. That's what most people would think about. That's the computer itself. You really don't go anywhere unless you have at least software, that is, specialized code that's designed to exploit that uh, particular parallel computing. And you also need specialists to facilitate doing the science. So you need human beings to actually who are trained in this to make this possible. And that's really what Arctic Region Supercomputing Center is an example of and makes this science possible. So I'll now show an example at the scale of the globe of one of these large simulations. This is the 2004 Sumatra earthquake magnitude 9.2. It's going to start right here offshore Sumatra. And you should watch as a rupture propagates to the north. So this. The time is shown in the upper left, and this, this, the waves take about an hour and a half to go around the Earth and an hour and a half to come back. But so watch in particular at the beginning, you'll really see what looks like a rupture tip going to the north. So there the rupture moves to the north, and now you're looking at the global wave field. So we're kind of as if we're flying overhead. This is the, the waves in the solid Earth, so not, not the tsunami. This is the solid Earth waves. They will converge at the antipode, at the point opposite the rupture. And here the graphics have been dimmed because it's nighttime. And these waves come back around. And as I said, to go all the way around from front to back to front takes about three hours. So that's this idea of conveying the global scale of earthquakes, how long they last. Um, this is showing you an example for really the best, at the time, the best recorded and largest earthquake that we have. 
Now what really matters from the standpoint of understanding something about the Earth is that we have seismometers that record the actual wave field. At isolated points on Earth, we have seismic instruments that record the wave field. So the red one shows the time series or the seismograms from the movie, and the black one shows the ones that are recorded by real seismometers. So you can see these are sorted times on the x-axis, and these are sorted by distance from the earthquake. So the ones at the top are closer to the earthquake, and that's why you have this kind of move out. But the point is that there's very good agreement here. There's enough agreement so that we can really be um, confident that the model of our Earth structure and the model of this very large earthquake is reasonably accurate. And so that's, we, we really here, we're not just running simulations to understand earthquakes, we're using data and real recordings to help understand them. We're now going to look at a different scale. This is a state-of-the-art simulation performed on national lab computers, so a, a massive uh, 100,000 core computing job for an earthquake in California. So we're looking at California on the side. This is a, a segment of an, a, a possible magnitude 8 earthquake that could rupture the San Andreas Fault, the kind of things when California talks about the big one. This is a possibility. So we have Los Angeles, Bakersfield, and this is going to start right here. So we'll, we'll show what this simulation looks like. This is a, a simulation that takes the, the, the best that we know about the structure of California and even the friction associated with faulting. So here are the earthquake ruptures, and you can see that as in many earthquakes, there's a tendency to go in a preference toward one direction. In this case, the rupture is going primarily to the south with a weaker part to the north. As the rupture takes off, we can see that the tip, if you call this the rupture tip, is here. It starts to develop what are mock cones. That is, when the earthquake rupture is traveling faster than the speed that the wave travels in the solid, it's just like a shock wave from a jet you get the same effect in earthquakes, and that's why you have these triangular mock, it's not, mock cones or the analog for the solid earth. So we'll watch as this propagates down. You can see quite a bit of complexity associated with the earthquake rupture. Still, if we had to point to the rupture tip, it's right here on the San Andreas, but you can see probably here's another uh, mock cone jumping out in front, the super shear, as they're called. But you can start to see a lot of complexity of the wave field. And Los Angeles is situated in a deep sedimentary basin. So you'll see as we come into Santa Barbara, Ventura, Ventura Basin, and LA Basin, you're seeing a lot of red on this map. There's a lot of strong shaking. And even though the rupture is currently right here, you can see Los Angeles is shaking strong and shaking hard. If you look at the same part in the Mojave Desert, there's really nothing going on. So this is showing you the intense effect that your local structure can have. And unfortunately for Los Angeles, uh, it's on a sedimentary basin that can strongly amplify the ground motion. Structure is now going into the Palm Springs region, so still sort of front of the rupture tip is in here. And in the last section we'll see it go into, this is the Salton Trough, Coachella Valley which is also the site of the very large basin. So you can see here the rupture is getting considerably larger. And just to get a sense of time, this is 147 seconds, so it's a little bit sped up. But we're talking about this whole movie we saw represents about three minutes of shaking. So you get a sense of how long, first of all, how long it takes just for the earthquake to go from start to finish. It takes about over uh, three minutes here. And then even after three minutes, you still have some shaking. Even at this point, Los Angeles is still shaking. So it's a very nice example of both doing the science as accurately as possible and also just uh, a really nice visualization. So let's move toward Alaska, toward looking at trying to do these similar kinds of uh, studies. Here we have a mesh that I've constructed. It's a chunk of the globe with Alaska on top. So this would be taking a big chunk of Earth where this is the mantle 
and the Earth's outer core, which is liquid, and then in the inner side, you would have a solid iron core. And so we're interested in propagating large earthquakes in, in, a, in a model that looks about like this. If we zoom in a little more, we can see this is where Alaska fits in on this chunk of the globe. We then have to mesh this. We have to chunk it up into pieces that can allow us to solve the physics of the problem. So that involves using these finite elements, or they're, they're elements that are kind of like deformed bricks. And these elements, within each element, are sets of grid points. And so you can see there's a lot of elements that go into making this mesh. And within each element, there's 125 points. So millions of points, and that's what kind of motivates using the supercomputer to solve the problem. I've just shown Fairbanks, Anchorage, and Juno as balls for scale. And the green lines are the plate boundaries that we looked at in the beginning. We then have to explain what is, it, what is it that we know about the variations in the structure. Well, here I've taken a global seismic model that's very coarse, but you can see this variations in blues and whites and reds. There's some idea of how the seismic waves will travel at different speeds in different parts of Alaska. I've also shown in pink the, uh, the stations, seismic stations that are currently in Alaska. And uh, as well, you can still see the, the cities for reference. I put in the, the faults, or at least the, the faults we assume to be active. For example, the Denali Fault is this one in here. So we're trying to get some reference for what we're looking at. And then the question is, well, what kind of earthquake do we look at? Well, in Southern California, the scenario earthquake that they used originally was, in fact, the Denali earthquake. Because at the time, the Denali earthquake, the 7.9, remains the best analog for looking at the large earthquakes on the San Andreas Fault. They took the model that scientists derived from the Denali earthquake, and they basically mapped it to the San Andreas Fault and looked at what the ground motion would, would be like. Well, we're in the same boat. There's a 2004 magnitude 9.2 Sumatra earthquake that occurred in a subduction zone. And even though we've had an earthquake in 1964, right on the Alaska subduction zone, um, it was not nearly as well recorded, being in 1964 versus uh, 2004. So here, to get a sense, this shows the size of the earthquake rupture. It's over 1,000 kilometers. The color shows the amount of slip. So red is 20 meters, meaning two, two pieces of earth moved relative to each other by 20 meters. And if you look at the size over 1,000 kilometers, yes, that is what generated a tsunami. That's what generates tsunamis. This earthquake killed, the tsunami alone killed over 200,000 people. So we take that earthquake and we map it directly to Alaska. It fits right here. And we're looking at how would this earthquake look like in Alaska. And just for, for context, you can see that the Sumatra earthquake was actually quite a bit larger in in area than the 1964, but in fact the, the magnitudes were the same, which, which tells you something about magnitude. It is that the, the amount of slip during 1964 was larger, even though the area may have been a little bit less. So here's our scenario that we're going to put in for this simulation. So this is performed on the Arctic Region Supercomputing Center, and we'll just watch uh, an earthquake rupture from here to here. Graphics are are not the same quality as the, uh, the California example, but you still get the effect that there's an earthquake rupture propagating east of the Aleutian. The whole movie here uh, represents something like 10 minutes, 20 minutes. So you can see that all this complexity in the wave field that we see is mainly due to the complexity of the rupture. So that kind of shows where we're beginning to implement into the three-dimensional models for Alaska possible earthquake models to look at ground motion in Alaska. Now, a key point is that in order to simulate accurate ground motion, we must accurately characterize the variations in the crust of Alaska. If I tell the computer that Alaska is some homogeneous um, unif you know, uniform block of rock, we're not going to get the variability in the wave field that we know occurs. And as I would say at the bottom, any geologic variations will manifest themselves in the wave field. It, we, we have a sense that you know, uh, a mountain range versus a sedimentary basin, a wave is going to see these things differently. And we know that from looking at seismometers. 
seismic recordings. So here in Anchorage, this is we're looking at Anchorage, this is Cook Inlet. The map app actually shows the sedimentary basin, sur basement, basin surface going from zero to seven kilometers deep of Cook Inlet Basin. We know this very well because this is where oil and gas is. So where there are oil and gas exploration, there are ways to determine uh, the, the subsurface structure by using not earthquakes, but actually explosives or vibrating sources. So we have a good representation of this bowl of sediment near Cook Inlet. If we look at the seismic stations, there's one here, two, three, four, five, six. These stations, shown from west to east here, show that for this earthquake in Anchorage, if, if you're a station right above the basin, you have very long lasting, this is time going in this direction, you have amplified ground motion and extended duration of shaking. If you look toward this third station, right on the edge of the basin, it's pretty quiet. So you see a very nice example that inside and outside these sedimentary basins, for the same earthquake at approximately the same distance from the source, you have a dramatically different effect of ground motion. And this is what we need to characterize because ultimately, in terms of building structures, insurance, uh, medical emergency response, we need to know what the shaking is going to be like. And so here is a simulation at a different scale that has that basin in there. Again, this is Anchorage. You can actually see the topography in here. This would be Cook Inlet. And these blue dots show where we actually have uh, seismic stations for recording. So here's the earthquake propagating outward. We'll look at some snapshots of this, but you can see scattering due to the wave field, really a dramatic effect of the basin. As the wave comes out, the, the, the waves are just trapped in the basin. There's stronger shaking. Even as the waves are gone, you can see that there are these residual uh, shaking of waves that have been trapped in the basin. So we'll look at a couple snapshots here. There's, at the edge of the basin, there's diffraction here. As the wave propagates out further, you can see scattering due to topography, especially in here. But in general, it's a high amplitude, uh, long-lasting shaking that occurs here. Even in the last frame, this is particularly apparent. So Cook Inlet Basin is a key target in Alaska that we're interested in, both because it's one of the biggest basins and also because it's in proximity to the largest population. In the interior, the, one of the key targets is Nana Basin, and that is as you drive south from Fairbanks, it, looking to the right to Minto Flats, essentially underneath Minto Flats is a large sedimentary basin, not at the scale of Cook Inlet, but they know this because oil and gas exploration can create their own uh, vibrating sources or explosives to send waves down and then record them. So this is showing a cross section of essentially it's lots of stacked seismograms where, we, where they've been able to show that the energy is reflecting from certain horizons. And so this kind of view of the data is represented in cartoon structure at the right, but it allows, uh, it allows scientists in the industry to, to get a sense of how large these basins are. And we want to characterize these basins within our models for Alaska. As, as, as much as there is data out there, we want to use everything we have to get the most accurate characterization of the structures. And this is what a chunk from one of our uh, wave field simulation meshes looks like. So there's each chunk like this is assigned to one computer and say we have 144 of these all stuck together to run one particular simulation for Alaska. But this shows the outline of Ninana Basin. You kind of get a sense of uh, the, the size of the elements relative to the targets we're interested in. You can kind of see this is the topographic effects where the top surface is accurately representing the topography as you go down into Minto Flats from the ridges, from the overlying ridges to the uh, east. So if we look at just a snapshot from, from, a couple, from this simulation, Here's a, an earthquake that happened in Kantishna. What we're looking at, this is Fairbanks, this is Ninana, this is Mount McKinley, the Denali Fault is kind of in here. So this is a magnitude five earthquake that occurred in 2011. And you see this first snapshot moving outward, going through Ninana Basin. Ninana Basin is 
has a pretty strong effect on the wave field. There are secondary scattering effects that happen as, as the wave propagates through. But what's most important for our purposes is that we have recordings in Alaska where we can compare the simulation with real seismograms, and that's what's shown here. So these are again sorted. Each station is sorted by distance from the, the earthquake. So here, the closest stations, the waves arrive first. And you can see the red is the simulation, the blue is the recorded seismogram. At a very challenging uh, perspective on the seismogram, we're looking at fairly high frequency content, and this is a pretty good fit. At least some of the wiggles here are matching well, and it gives us some confidence that we can begin to try to improve these models. So I want to emphasize that really this is driven by real data. The real seismic recordings allow us to get better information on both the properties of the earthquakes and the Earth's structure. So I'll now show a movie from this Christchurch earthquake, magnitude 6.1. So realistically, 6.1 is it's not a large earthquake, and this is uh, more than possible to have this in interior Alaska. We had this magnitude 6 in the Minto Flats, but in this case, it's occurring right very close to the, to the tent to the city of Christchurch, and the effects are dramatic. And after all it had been through, then at nine minutes to one. <laughs> an ordinary Tuesday lunchtime, the earth roars louder, more violently than before. Because although this was smaller on the Richter scale than the big quake of September, this time around, the fury was centered much shallower, only five kilometers deep, and much closer, just 10 kilometers from the city, near Littleton. It hit like a bomb. It hit like a blitzkrieg of bombs. In the moments afterwards, chaos, confusion, fear. The images we're used to seeing from some foreign city, not one of our own. At the press building, the roof has collapsed entirely, leaving workers pinned under their desks, unable to move or even see each other. Loss of buildings paling in comparison, even such celebrated landmarks as the Christchurch Cathedral. You know, the buildings are buildings, so the really important thing are the people, and uh, we just don't know if there are people under this rubble. I fear there are. They're everywhere, all over central Christchurch, now crumbled, contorted ruins. As news comes in that there are at least 30 trapped in the Pine Gould building, rescuers work frantically to get them out. But already there's one confirmed fatality. with those who have escaped unhurt from elsewhere finding refuge in Hagley Park, which itself shows profound scars. And for the first time, the true toll begins to emerge. So the advice I've had so far is that 65 people have lost their lives. Um, we can't rule out. So that's really just, uh, you know, a dramatic example of shaking that's stronger than expected for a magnitude six earthquake and the kind of damage that can it can occur uh, even in a first world type construction. Um, as they said, this is not looking at a uh, city in Pakistan or Iran where, where we've seen complete devastation, but it's primarily on account of the engineering. So we're now going to move to what, what, what is being done at the scale of trying to understand how buildings respond to ground motion. And this is the largest simulation ever conducted done in Japan looking at how a building responds to magnitude 7.5 ground motion. So we'll see two views, one where from here and then there's a camera inside the building which is a little more impressive in terms of how much shaking is actually happening. And after the test you'll, you'll hear you'll hear some people cheer. I think it's because the building didn't fall down.
So here's the same view from inside inside the building. So that, that experiment clearly is a many, many million, multi-million dollar experiment. Another way to approach this is again, to, on the computational side, to implement models of, of buildings on a computer and to basically drive their motion using realistic ground motion. And this is a simulation done by a professor at California Institute of Technology. And so there are two different buildings being experienced to this uh, to the same ground motion and you'll probably see which one is is better suited to withstand the motion so one building has reinforced uh, joints one pancakes and the pancaking is a worst case scenario for a building so even though the one at the bottom experiences permanent deformation, you wouldn't go down, you couldn't go down an elevator in this case, for example, but it didn't collapse. So the goal is to build a building so that people can get out of it and so that it doesn't collapse. So what can you do when you feel an earthquake? I recommend go to the USGS Did You Feel It website. This is the example for one in Esther, Alaska. Um, and this is showing you what really can be possible if if there's enough responses and information, but the idea is that this is really scientifically useful information, the example from Southern California. So participate in the uh, seismological community through, through the internet. I wanted to mention something coming up for Alaska, a tremendous opportunity scientifically. Popular Science ran the big science, the universe's 10 most epic projects, and number one on the list was something called the Earth Scope. And this is a seismic deployment of a continental scale. There's hundreds of stations that essentially kind of leapfrog each other and roll across the entire lower, lower 48. Currently, they're somewhere out here. And by having this array of stations, we're looking not outward like a telescope, we're looking inward. We're taking seismic waves, and we're trying to image the structure of North America and understand more about the evolution, the geologic evolution of North America. And this is supposed to be coming to Alaska in 2014. Now the main difference is, you can imagine, is accessibility. Every single station in the lower 48 you can drive to by car, and essentially none of them in Alaska is that the case. So here I've shown a map of sort of potential station sites, and we should really get excited about the prospects of what other kind of large-scale science can be done by having essentially a scientific observatory blanketing the state. Yes, there's going to be primarily seismometers, but you can imagine temperature, permafrost boreholes. It's a really exciting opportunity to, uh, that we're going to have to learn more about uh, Alaska for both understanding the, the structure and for the long run, understanding earthquakes and seismic hazards. So finally, Earthquake sources and subsequent wave propagation can be accurately modeled with the help of supercomputers. Our ability to accurately model ground motion is limited by our ability to characterize the complex variations in Earth's crust and basin. The better we know this, this crustal structure, the better and more accurate our ground motion will be. Seismology is relevant for earthquake hazard assessment, oil exploration, nuclear monitoring, and imaging the interior of our planet topics that I really didn't cover here, but I'd be happy to discuss later. Much of Alaska, including Fairbanks, is prone to magnitude greater than seven earthquakes, and it really is only a matter of time. You won't stop plate tectonics, and you won't be stopping earthquakes. As Pierre St. Amand wrote in 1948, it's strongly recommended that any construction undertaken in the Tanana Valley be designed to withstand violent earthquakes, and that whenever possible, construction on silt should be avoided. So even in 1948, there was an idea that we should be cautious and be aware that strong shaking can and will happen here. Thank you very much.